Welcome to a episode of Afikra Movie Night. Our special guest is Amr Salama, who is a uh, famous uh, director and writer who has written and directed multiple award-winning feature films on a day like today. Asma, excuse my French, made in Egypt, Sheikh Jackson, and co-directed uh, the, the uh, documentary Tahrir 2011, and as well as the person behind Paranormal. We are excited to have you on this series. Ahmed, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Michael. So, you know, I wanted to, I think most people who, uh, uh, who are familiar with your work, who, are, who have recently become familiar with your work, have sort of entered into your sphere um, through Netflix's show Paranormal, which is how I became familiar with your work. But actually, before we get to that, I want to go back to the very beginning and talk about how you got started. Um, and in particular, talk about this short film, uh, which is available <laughs> to watch on IMDb. I was so thrilled to see that it was available. So your, uh, I think, student film uh, in 2004, Shahada, um, is really wonderful to watch. And I have a specific question related to it, which sure. is um, when I was watching this film, um, this 10 minute short, I took a screenshot of a particular film. It reeks, 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 reeks uh, Tarantino. Um, and in particular, um, uh, uh, Reservoir Dogs. Um, yeah. And so I was wondering, am I wrong? in guessing that he's one of your biggest influences. And if I'm wrong, who were some of your biggest influences growing up? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for reminding me of this film. I, I forgot, I, I totally forgot it. Uh, I shot it in 2004. That makes it, wow, 19 years now, I feel yeah. old. Uh, <laughs> you feel old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but to answer both of the questions, uh, I, I was not a film student. Uh, I, I never studied film uh, uh, academically. I've never went to film school. Uh, I was actually at that time uh, studying accounting. Uh, uh, and uh, I had, uh, uh, I, 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 I can't say love of film, I can say love of art because I remember when I was a kid, I, I used to draw a lot, I used to write a lot, I used to miserably try to learn music but failed uh but uh i, I loved all kinds of arts and uh, uh i was more drawn into uh doing uh animation and i i wanted to be an animated animation artist i wanted to do many things but the thing that i took seriously was animation and i started uh learning animation on my own taking a couple of like small courses uh, uh, uh and then i got uh, more involved in 3d animation uh, but back then, the the scene of uh, animation in Egypt was not that big. It was uh, uh, it was far from, uh, and it still is somewhere somehow. It's it's still far from doing a real three uh, D animation film like the ones I loved when I was that uh, at that age. I was I was in love with Shrek, Toy Story, all these kind of three D animation film. I was so uh, blown away by Pixar uh, company and their films. <laughs> So I decided to maybe be involved more in visual effects. But as I didn't know anyone from the film industry, I didn't know which doors to knock. I, I started uh, doing stuff on my own until I found myself become a, a director because it made sense. It's, it's the thing that literally uh, collects all these skills and talents that I thought I had uh, in one place. So I started making short films with, on my own with zero budgets. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this film you, you, you're referring to, El Shahada, is, uh, is, is influenced by, by two things. A book that I read that I loved back then, which was Omar Tirakubian, and of course Tarantino films, although I'm not the biggest fan of Tarantino, like he's not one of my favorite directors, but I was influenced by uh, films back then, uh, uh, as, as, as all my generation uh, uh, was. So I... I uh, uh, yeah, I think it, I had an influence of Tarantino when I was doing this film. And ironically, ironically, uh, the film I'm shooting now that I'm almost finishing is somehow influenced by that short film, but in a totally different story. But but it was uh, 
it's, it has somehow the same premise one way or another. So this film, I wrote it, I directed it, and then I wrote it into a feature, and it was really bad. So I kept rewriting, 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 and changing and changing until it became the film that I'm shooting ex- exactly right now. So what, what film is that? It's called Chemerich, which uh, in English we're calling it Fireworks. Uh, it's an action film that has a love story and uh, a lot of conflict of interests, like the film uh, Shahada, mm-hmm. which I, I I don't think I watched Shahada since I made it, which which means like I hadn't watched this film like maybe at least 17 years ago, since, since 17 years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if I still have it, actually. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a bit nostalgic talking about it uh, and ironic at the same time because it's the same idea that kept uh, like uh, growing with me until it became the film I'm shooting now. Yeah, I mean, you, your films are very layered um, and they they have these sort of multiple storylines. Um, so walk me through the decision to, you know, start, you, you, leave, you leave accounting, you start making these short films. At what point do you say to yourself, you know, I'm actually a writer director. This is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my career. Yeah. uh, So uh, back then we had a group of friends. uh, Like uh, I had, I had, I have a, I had a close friend uh, whose older brother uh, and his friends were doing uh, films that they were doing on, on their own comedy films that they kept like shooting and editing on their own and then screening them. Like they would book a cafe and then they screen it in a cafe and then after that, the films got like, uh, before it got viral before there was internet. It was like, back then there was hard disks. So people used to like to like give each other like films on hard disks and, and stuff like that. So the film got really viral and everyone in the country watched it. And we were influenced by this group. Uh, and me and my friend, we were like the younger generation, although we like we're just two or three years younger. So we started like doing our own film. And we didn't know who's directing. We, we had discovered by the middle of the shoot that I am the director because I was the one doing everything. So uh, w- w- when we finished that film, like we tried to mimic the uh, the experience. So we, we, we booked a cafe, we screened it in a cafe and uh, I printed those flyers, uh, like black and white flyers. I kept like throwing them everywhere in my university and, and in my club and stuff like that. So people actually came and watched the film and 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 the moment of uh first like the film was really bad and and, and it was trying to be funny and it was not but people like were super excited about kids like themselves like doing a small film and screening it on screen and stuff like that so but anyhow the, the moment of connection between the audience and the screen this magical connection uh between someone sitting on a chair watching something on a screen and emotionally in- interacting with it and then, of course, the validation after they watched the film and started like clapping their hands and cheering for us and stuff like that. That moment where, like, where I felt like I should be doing this. That's what I was back then. Uh, that was 2001, so I was 18, 19 years old. I was studying accounting, and I thought, like, like really, this is what I want to do. Like this magic of this magical interaction and magical connection between. Uh, someone who's watching and something on a screen that they know that it's not real, but they're still emotionally uh, engaging with it. It's, I felt like this is the magic I want to be involved with. It's so cool. Um, okay. So the, the idea of movie night as a series that we try to get people to watch uh, one, of, one of the filmmakers films, um, and then we get a chance to, to talk about it. So for anyone who has Netflix, you can find Asma on Netflix if you're just listening to this now. Um, so this is a probably a good time to pause and watch it. If not, you can go back and watch it. So let's talk a little bit about Asma as a as a film. And then we'll spend some time talking about some of your other films, including Sheikh Jackson and Excuse My French. And then we're going to talk about Paranormal as well. But the first thing that's, um, that is clear when you click play on this film is inspired by true events. Uh, true events. Um, yes. And this is a wild story. So uh, if if that wasn't there, I would think that this is just a, a crazy story you came up with um, that is quite literally unbelievable. Um, yeah. But so in your words, if you can just kind of give a, a brief overview of what 
what the film is and, and these true events that you're retelling. Sure. Um, because I found them to be, you know, really, really hard to believe. Sure. Uh, so it all started with me, like uh, a company called me, like a small company back then called me and said, like, we're doing this very small documentary on people living with HIV. Uh, and, and they wanted me as a director because I was young and, and, and cheap. So I, I started, like, I went and I started, like, meeting all these people living with HIV in Egypt. And as any, any, any Egyptian, especially any young and not very well educated uh, young man, I was not uh, aware of, of what is HIV, what is AIDS, how should I interact with them and stuff like that. But anyhow, uh, uh, they educated me before I shot the film, before I meet the people. And after I shot this documentary, I felt very touched uh, by their stories and everything. It was a very short documentary. Uh, so it was like a, like a 11 minutes, something like that. So... Uh, after that, you and eight uh, called me and said, like, we really uh, want, want you, like, we, we want to sponsor script. And maybe the script, will, uh, we, we don't have, like, we don't have fund to, to produce it, but we want to fund the script. Maybe it will find its way. So uh, I took the job and uh, I started writing a script. And of course, I started about thinking about all the cool ideas that, I, that are influenced by American films and European films I'm watching and I was like, I started crafting this idea and this idea and this idea and none of them felt uh, real, to be honest. Uh, and none of them felt like, and, and I, it was the first film I, I write for hire, which means someone comes to me with a topic or an idea and tell me like, can you write about it? So it was really hard. And I, and I, and I wanted to drop out like a couple of times. I felt very frustrated because I felt like who, who wants to watch a film about HIV or AIDS? Uh, it's going to be very, like, uh, uh, not appealing, to say the least, to the audience. And so I went to UNAIDS. Uh, with Sam, there was a, like, um, Usama was, B was the manager back then. And Usama B, I, I really uh, salute her for, for having faith in me and in the project. And I told her, like, I really can't continue this uh, uh, this writing job. So I said, I, I really can't do it. So she said, okay, before you decide not to do it, and uh, uh, can you come with me to one of the like the meetings with people living with HIV? So it was in another city. We took the train. I went there. I said, I'm just going to do this meeting for courtesy. I'm not going to write this film anyhow. And I went there. I, I <laughs> First thing that touched me was when I got into the room, I found like around 20 people living with HIV in one room. And the f when I f got in, the kind of look uh and their eyes to me when i got into the room i felt like like this looking at at me as, as as if i'm the savior in in one way because they they were suffering from stigma and 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 a lot of like prejudices and a lot of suffering even from from the from the society and even from their families so they thought this film's going to change their lives so they looked at me as like with this look of like, uh, please save us from what we're living in. And they thought a film would be the way to, to, to do that. And I was very touched. Uh, and then I kept hearing their stories and their stories are like super painful and super inspiring at the same time. And then uh, I, 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 I started collecting all this sadness inside me and said like, I, I don't want to continue in this. Like, although I'm very empathetic and, and sympathetic for what they're saying, but it's very hard to spend months or years trying to do a film about something that makes you feel that sad. And uh, right after that, just before I was leaving to catch my train, I remember them saying, I just met this woman who died a week ago. Uh, and this is her story. And they told me the story. And I remember when I heard the story, uh, I, 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 I was trying to contain myself not to cry in front of them. And then, I got into the train with Wissam and we were going back to Cairo and all the time when I was going, in the tra I, I was crying almost the whole trip, thinking about this woman and her real story. And, uh, and I remember in that trip, uh, I kept telling myself, uh, I know I'm doing a film that's maybe not commercial, not super appealing to the masses and this and that. But I think uh, if I'm not... Uh, telling a story uh, that really touched me that much. So why would I continue being in this job? I, I, didn't, I didn't become an accountant because I didn't just want to work for money. I, I wanted to work a job where I felt that I belong to and that I have a purpose. 
So I thought like my purpose as a storyteller is when I'm, I'm loaded with this emotional charge, I should translate it into a work of art. Uh, so I decided I'm going to write this film and it took literally three years to, to reach a draft that I'm proud of to shoot and the finances to do the film. Uh, three years, it was a very, very tough three years because I didn't have any source of income. I was just writing this film and rewriting this film. I wrote it more than 25 times, 25 drafts until finally uh, we, you got the chance to shoot it and we shot it and uh, and it, it, it went out right after the revolution. It was a very bad time uh, politically and uh, there was no safety in the streets. So it was even harder for people to go watch it in the theaters. But, uh, but but until this day, this is the film I'm proud of the most uh, because I managed to uh, tell a story not just about AIDS or this woman that I was so inspired by, but I told a story about myself and I made it as personal as I can to not just make it a film about AIDS. It's a film, at the end of the day, it's a film about me. It's a film about feeling, of, feeling society and, and, and the courage to... Uh, to confront society and uh, uh, and it got me a lot of awards, a lot of recognition. Uh, and until now, until this day, whenever I meet someone here or uh, abroad or in the States or in Europe, and they tell me, what films do I watch for you? I recommend them as well. You know, um, I want to play the trailer, um, which sure. we have loaded up. So let's watch a little bit of the trailer, then have some more questions. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا أعزائي المشاهدين حب أقول لكم أن الشخصية اللي معانا مش مكئبة نهائي على قد ما هي مبهرة عرفينا بنفسك <تصفيق> أني اسمي أسماء أني عندي إد مين فيكم يحب ان اسماء تفضل معانا هنا؟ قولي لنا ما بتصلي دايما بتعيطي خشوح؟ ها؟ ولا عارفه انك عملتي مصيبه وعمر ربنا هيسامحك عليها المرضى جالك ازاي؟ كل واحد مستني المهدي المنتظر، ما حدش عايز يدفع ثمن حاجه ابدا هو المسكنات اللي عماله تحنيها في جدتك خلتك ما تبقيش حاسه بنفسك ولا حاسه حتى باللي بيتهرق حواليك طب ونفسك في ايه يا اسماء؟ نفسي في ايه؟ تشكر يا اسماء فرصة سعيدة جدا أنا أسعد Before we keep going, uh, Ahmed, what is it like to watch these scenes? Uh, very emotional, to be honest. Uh, again, I, I hadn't watched the film in quite some time. Uh, so uh, all these memories, all this... Uh, yeah, it's nostalgic and, uh, and uh, emotional. Uh, I, I think I... Uh, it, it was, again, uh, the film that I shot with... Uh, with a lot of emotions. Uh, and, and I think uh, I still find it in the video, I don't know if people will connect with it the way 
and, and feel the way I feel, but uh, it, it, it was very emotional for me. Yeah. It was a hard to get financing. Cause I mean, the part of the, part of the, the plot of the story and part of the story is that there is stigma, right? And the, there's yeah. this, this main protagonist, Asma, who's living in Cairo yeah. in, you know, modern day. And she's contracted HIV for, I won't, I won't say why and how, but she's contracted HIV and she's afraid to talk about it. And it's actually stopping her from getting a medical treatment for another condition that she has. Um, and she can't talk about it. And it's this huge stigma. Um, yeah. And it's actually, I, I'll, I'll out myself by saying that I didn't realize how much of an issue HIV was across the Arab world and in Egypt. Um, but so insofar as there's such a stigma attached to it, was it hard to get financing? To yeah, it was very hard. It was very, very hard. Uh, uh, the film... Uh, you can imagine like going in a room uh, to any producer and pitching like, hey, I want to make a film about a woman suffering with HIV. Uh, all the keywords you should not say in a pitching room, you know, like first a woman, <laughs> because back then uh, uh, it was more profitable to make films led by, by men, male actors. Uh, uh, second, suffering, which is uh, a sad film. Uh, uh, it's not a comedy, it's not an action. And third, HIV, which is a big, like, uh, a no-no world, you know, like, and no, no one's want to, like, hear about HIV. So uh, uh, I'm not going to, like, any, for any producer, I will think I'm not going to put millions in a film about something people don't want to hear about. So yeah. it was it was really hard. Uh, what made it uh, get finances, two things. Uh, first of all, Hen Sobri. Uh, having Hen Sobri attached uh, made it a lot easier because a lot of people were excited about Hen Sobri and the production company that ended up financing the film, they financed the film because they wanted to make a film for Hen Sobri, whatever that film was. So, uh, so Hen Sobri uh, is, is one of the biggest reasons why I, I was able to make the film. Uh, second reason was the script. Uh, the first producer that got on the film, Mohamed Hevzi, uh, really loved the script and got uh, touched by it, but but still, we couldn't have the money to to do the film until New Century came on board, the company that ended up producing and financing the film, and uh, together they made the film and and uh, uh, it was it was not a cheap film to make, to be honest, as well yeah, because. I mean, it's there's all these sets, there's all these locations. Yeah, sets and locations, and, and especially the makeup, because I wanted to make Hensobi look as much as I can to the real character. So uh, the real person uh, she was playing, and so I had to do a lot of prosthetics. That's not her nose, that's not her cheeks, uh, that's not her hair. Uh, so we got out like uh, literally a... Uh, uh, one of the best makeup artists in the world back then. Uh, she was an Oscar nominee. She worked on Nicole Kidman's nose and the hours. She worked on the scene side uh, on Javier Bardem, uh, the makeup of Javier Bardem in the scene side, the Spanish film that won the Oscars. So she was like on the top of her game. And she, 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 she and her team, at least, we spent at least uh uh, fifth of the film's budget on them, so uh, it it was it was a lot of money, and uh, uh, and back then Hen Sabri was pregnant, and she was shooting the film while like he was, she was pregnant, and actually in the last couple of months in her pregnancy, so we couldn't shoot more than eight or nine hours, which was really tough. Uh, so it, we, it, it took us a long time to shoot the film, and. Uh, uh, so it was not a it, it was not a, a small budget film. Yeah. And, was and Hind, was yeah. Hind aware of the story at the end? You know the final the final text. The um, there's a little bit of a, a revisionist story. Uh, yeah, you, know, you kind of sort of revise the ending. Um, but the true events was Hind aware of the true events and aware of what you know this person's story. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny story because I remember uh, I wrote this film before even my first film came out. So I was, and nobody knew about me. And I was in this event for HIV and Hensabi was there as a guest. 
uh, uh, I went to her and said, listen, I'm a new director, but one day I'm going to make this film with you about HIV. And she said, okay, cool. And she was being nice. And then after my film, film, film first, uh, first film came out, she, she actually was one of the actresses that I offered the film to and she refused it, the first film I made. So uh, after the film came out, she, 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 she met me by chance and she said, actually, I, liked, I didn't like the film, but I liked the, your, <laughs> your directing style so much. I thought like you're a really good director. I love the honesty. I didn't like the film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hint, hint. That's what, what I love about Hint. Hint is like no bullshit. Like Hint, like little bit doesn't <laughs> So, and that's why it was not an easy journey to write the film because I was, uh, I, I, I remember my first film was super like American influenced uh, film. It was, uh, I was being a director in the film in every shot. I was, it was super plot driven. So, uh, and after I finished the film, but my first film, I thought like, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to make a film about like, uh, like the films I like in the States or in Europe. I want to make a film about Egypt, about real Egyptians. That's the first goal I had. The second goal I had is like, I want to make a character driven film, not a plot driven film. So I read about all these films that I liked about character driven films. And uh, one of them that really influenced me was uh, There Will Be Blood by PTA Paul Thomas Anderson. And, and uh, yeah. And Daniel Day Lewis, and, and I remember like then uh, Paul Thomas Anderson said because I wanted to make a character-driven film, I had to sit with 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 Daniel Day Lewis and write the film all, almost together. And I wouldn't yeah. do anything in the script that he wouldn't do as a character. Uh, so it was a, like a collaborative way of writing a screenplay. So I was influenced by that. I said to him the same thing: Let's write this film together. I will not write anything that you wouldn't feel as an actress uh, that you would do for this character. And then I regretted saying that like for three years because Hint is a, is a very uh, intellectual uh, human being and she's very stubborn as well. And that's what I love about her. And she was like, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do yeah. that. I wouldn't do that. That's why Con I would. Conveniently, Esma is also very stubborn. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I remember like when we first met... Uh, Hen told me, like, why me? Like, why did you choose me? And I love this question when actors ask me, why me? I said, because you're the most, like, stubborn person I know. Like, you're, you have this strong personality. And ironically, you're not Egyptian, but ironically, you are the most Egyptian actress in the market. Like, like I really believe you're an Egyptian. Like, uh, if I want to, like, portray an Egyptian girl, Hen Sabi will be the one to go to, although she's not Egyptian. She's the only one who's not Egyptian back then. So, uh so we kept writing this for for yeah for for three years. It was a very collaborative uh, experiment between me and Hent, and we fought a lot. We disagreed a lot, uh, uh, a lot. And uh, for three years, we ke I kept writing and going back to her, and we kept having this discussion. And she was not convinced at all with the character choice at the end, at all. Like the the reveal, like how she conducted dates. So she was like, I, nobody would do that. Nobody in the world would do something like, I know it's romantic, it's poetic, but nobody would do that. I said, but the real person did that. She said, I don't believe it. Like, so I, I, I kept rewriting and rewriting, but I really didn't want to lose that because that was the real story. That was what I loved about the story, the sacrifice. So I thought, oh, listen, I'm, I'm going to do my own homework. I went there and I went to UNAIDS and I asked them, like, I really find, want to find a real woman who did something like that and make her sit with him. They found me three. Wow. So, yeah. So I told him, like, please come. I have this meeting. You're going to meet three women with HIV. They want to tell you their stories. I remember that meeting very well. I was sitting outside. Hen was in the room meeting one woman after another. And then I remember seeing him coming out of the room, crying like a baby and telling me, like, I'm convinced now I'm going to make the film. Like... I remember uh, she, uh, uh, and that's why, uh, again, it was a very emotional experience for him as well. Like, uh, if you ask, Hitler, if you if you hung up with me right now and call him and tell her, like, what was the most emo emotional experience you had while making a film? It, again, it will, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident she will tell you as well. Yeah. I want to uh, talk about the sort of urban, rural also dichotomy that you have going on. You know, a lot of people when that don't know Egypt very well, they think Egypt, Cairo, Egypt, pyramids, right? Yes. 
and they think that that's like it. Yeah. Whereas Egypt it, as a country is like almost like a, it's like the size of a continent. It's huge. Yes. Um, and I think you do a really effective job at showing com- these two completely different worlds. Um, is that a world you're also you were also very familiar with before you decided to embark on uh, making the film? No, uh, at all. And that's why, like, I thought uh, when I was doing this film, I tried to remember the last film that that actually uh, was set in, 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 a, in a rural town in Egypt. And, and I couldn't find one in the last 20 years. Yeah. And, and I thought, like, wow, why, why, why? Because, like, like Egypt is an agricultural, supposedly agricultural country. And yeah. At least, at least 60, 70 percent people of the people living in Egypt live in the rural uh, small towns. Uh, so I thought I don't know Egypt, and I, how can I write about a setting that I've never been to? So again, I was influenced by a film I watched, which was Gandhi, and I remember the journey that Gandhi made in his country when he came back from South Africa and 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 and, and the UK, and he wanted to know his own people, so he took the train and went to all like India trying to understand the people. And uh, uh, somehow I managed to do something like that. I started deciding that I'm going to visit all the, the governments of Egypt, which are many. And I started making a call online back then. Facebook was, was, was becoming a thing back then. And I was like telling people, like, do I know anyone in Fayoum? Do I know anyone in Smalaya? Do I know anyone in Ben Had? Do I know anyone in Beni Swift? All these cities that I've, I would never go to like, uh, ever so, I started finding like friends, a lot of friends like guiding me, and I started doing this trip sometimes alone, sometimes with friends to all towns, small world. I don't want to go to the big cities. I went to small world towns to understand the culture, to understand everything. I, I used to spend like three or four days in each city, and that's the perks of doing a film when you're in your early twenties because, uh, like, you have time <laughs> for research, you have time for doing all this trips and you have time to yeah. to dedicate uh, all your time and energy to your projects you know you're not uh, uh you don't have all these obligations i didn't have a family i didn't like i mean i was not married i was so i was i was uh i went to the trip and i understood a lot of it because i wanted this film to be as authentic as i as, as possible i i i wanted me to be uh a discoverer more than a uh, an artistic dictator that will tell how the film goes. I wanted to take everything from real life. And I remember I said to myself, I'm not going to put any line in the film <laughs> or any yeah. event in the film that I didn't hear or I didn't uh, uh, find in my research. So that's why the film took a lot of research, a lot of research. Three years of writing and researching. And, and I remember... Uh, there was this diary online. It was like a blog. It was a diary for all the people living with HIV. Everyone anonymously would go on and write their experience. I used to read this blog for like almost three years. Uh, wow. I learned all kinds of medications. I met people living with HIV many, many times um, uh, until a point where I started to believe I'm an expert. Like I remember back then, people when they had a relative or someone they know that con- contracted HIV, uh, would call me and tell me like, what do we do? Because I was the man to go to when you want to ask about HIV back then. Yeah. I want to talk about the, the TV show aspect, right? The um, yeah. hot topics. Uh, yeah. um, and so for those who haven't seen the film yet, basically the, the, the context is there is this like TV show that's very common in the Arab world um, that discusses taboo topics, societal issues, and often has, this like silhouetted character who doesn't want to reveal their face or their name. And they, sometimes they change their voice too. Um, is this, was this based off the real events? This is part of the idea. Um, and if so, do you feel like there's been a, a, a change in societal views um, over the last 10 years? Like have people in Egypt started to be more empathetic, be uh, more well-informed through these shows um or do you feel like these shows kind of do a a disservice or they're not that they're not that helpful one way or another 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was based on a true story. Uh, uh, Asma, the, the real Asma. That was not her name, by the way. But she decided to go on TV and, and, and show her face. But she backed uh, down in, like in the last minute. Uh, she changed her mind in the last minute. And she didn't go on TV with her face. And she died almost like a week after the show. Uh, and uh, back then, no... Uh, person living with HIV ever uh, revealed uh, his or her face on television uh, before the show, uh, before the film. Uh, and the film, back then, TV shows uh, uh, like these uh, were really, really influencing the, the Egyptian society. Uh, especially there were two or three hosts that were really, really, really uh, influential back then. And it was, uh, if you want to change the country's mind about something, uh, a, a TV show like an episode like that would, would really start the conversation. Yeah. I don't think that's the case now, that the influence is not that big now, but back then it was the thing. There was no like trends. There were no like, Twitter was not big. Facebook was not big. So TV shows were the way to go if you want to like have a national debate. So, uh, and that was the thing. I, I, I also asked myself, this film is about a woman feeding society and she wants to confront society. So what's the best way to do that? Best way to do that at that time was going on a TV and says on one of those shows and, 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 and uh, uh, getting out of the closet and, and, and saying what she has. Uh, so that was inspired by, by two events. And uh, sadly, the real character didn't show her face. Uh, and then after after the film went out, uh, it started to happen that a lot of people actually with HIV went on television and and, and showed their face. Uh, and and it happened many times after that show after the film. And I really can't tell and can't claim that I know exactly how how the society changed their perspective about AIDS after the film. But uh, based on what they told me in UN AIDS, it made a significant change. Especially after it went wow. on, it went on television, and uh, I, I witnessed uh, by myself at least three cases of people meeting me and telling me they have HIV, and they came out after the film, and uh, and the the uh, their family understood, and 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 it wasn't that harsh for them because literally everyone that I interviewed before the film, from the many 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 people I met with HIV none of them told their families, none of them uh, at all. Yeah. A lot of them didn't tell their, their kids, their wives, their brothers, their sisters, their parents. So after the film went out, I, I met at least three cases that I remember that told me they, they told their families after the film went out. Amazing. Um, I want to change lanes a little bit and talk about some of your other films um, before, we, before we move on where I want to ask you about Paranormal. Um, you, you know, you've, you have, um, you've produced, a, a written and directed quite a large number. Um, it's, you know, it, insofar as it took, you know, three years to write on, uh, finish Esma, uh, Esma, where do these ideas come from? And it like you, you, ha you told us Esma, but, uh, Sheikh Jackson, uh, there's a lot of different types of films. Um, excuse my French, you know, where are these ideas coming from? Uh, uh, there's no like magical place where ideas come from. I believe that, but it's all about your rewiring your brain to try to translate everything you hear, or see into a film. If you, if, if you're obsessed about films that much, you can hear any story from your mom, from a friend, from a waiter in a cafe. And you would say to yourself, is this filmable? Is this can this turn into a story, uh, interesting story to tell? Uh, that's how you think. That's how you wire your brain. So your brain, by default now, like whenever they see, like sometimes you see a film and you expect something and it doesn't happen in a film and that turns into another film you write. So so your brain is wired in a way uh, uh, to translate everything into this question, will it turn into a film or not? So, and I'm, I'm sure like if you're, if you're, if you work in any profession and obsessed about your profession and, and obsessed about your work, yeah, your brain starts like I, I'm sure you meet anyone in the street and say, like, 
would this be an interesting episode to like make a podcast with this person yeah. or not? So, <laughs> so, so this is how you like, if you're obsessed enough, like it needs a lot of obsession yeah. uh, to have, to wire your brain like that. So that's why I have in my drawer 53 projects that I still haven't made until now. So, so yeah. I, I write a lot. I have a lot of stories that I want to tell because that's the key question. If you conscious and subconscious sense things like that, sometimes you go to sleep at night, uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and your brain wanders and bingo, you have a story, you know? So, so it needs a lot of obsession and needs a lot of like reading, watching films, uh, reading scripts, uh, 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 to have your brain wired like that, to have it function like that, to have it, always asking the question, what would be a good story? Is this can be, a, does this make a good story to tell or not? And uh, having other elements in your brain, like, will this make money? Will this appeal to an actor? Will this be sold to a producer? Will this uh, be uh, a film for, tele- for for platform or for uh, theaters or for, for a TV show? Or, and, and my waking life, like at least a good chunk of my, day is about that it's about what stories should i tell how can i develop this whole idea that i had that never worked on it and and that's that's i think where ideas come from they come from obsession and loving your work uh, enough uh, to to have this eyeglasses of your work and you see life with it yeah okay so here's a question about egyptian film um you know, if you if you go on Google and you type in like Egyptian cinema, it's there's this like bifurcated history, right? There's the yeah. the pre Nasser like golden age of cinema uh, stuff that you think you know the oil painted uh, posters, <laughs> uh, yeah. those that those films, and then there's obviously contemporary stuff. Um, do you feel directly connected to that era? Do you feel like you're building on that era, th- those films from the you know 40s, 50s, and 60s? Um, you know, we were talking about films that depict Egypt. Um, I mean, like Yusuf Shaheen did a great job of of depicting all these different alleyways of of Egypt. Do you feel like you're building on that, and you're actually part of the same lineage, or do you feel like they are completely two different things? No, I, I feel so, but I, I believe as well that we are the last generation uh, <laughs> that will be influenced by that era. Because I remember when we were kids, we didn't have a choice. We only have two channels on television. If you don't watch Channel 1, you're watching Channel 2. You have no third option. So you had to watch all these films when you were a kid, and you had to be influenced by them. Like uh, uh, they, they were the only option. There was no chance. There was only like this show once in a week that would show an American film and nobody would watch it. And uh, so it was all like my, until um, at least I was 17, 99% of the films I watched were Egyptian films. So, yeah. so uh, of course I was influenced by them so much. And uh, after I became a professional director and after I started like studying uh, the history of film in Egypt, uh, it's so rich, so rich, and uh, and and you can understand politics, and you can understand society, and you can For understand sure. all, all all the aspects of life from these films, and and you can understand censorship, and you can understand who's running the country, and what was the direction of politics back then, and 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 so so, and and we had great filmmakers, not just Yusuf Shane. I love Yusuf Shane, but I also love Kamel Sheikh Salah Bousif. Uh, out of Salem, like a lot of names that did things that were very, very progressive. And when you compare the Egyptian film until at least the 60s, the late 60s, with yeah. international films, you would see them like head to head with the quality and with the with with the, with, with, the, with, with the, the kind of stories and the kind of experimentation that used to happen. Yeah. So uh, after that, of course, of course, after the 70s, uh, there was a drop. But uh, again. Uh, you find what I call them, like maybe the nights or the musket years of filmmaking after the, after the 70s and the drop that happened in the market, you find always a, at least five directors in each generation which hold the torch and, and decides to make 
uh, serious films, important films, and uh, personal films and influential films. And those who are inspired us the most. And, and, and I remember like this generation, especially the, the directors of the 80s and the 90s, uh, I, I almost met all of them. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm a geek. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm the geekiest director you'll find. So I love meeting them and hearing from them the stories behind each film, behind every artistic decision they took, uh, but behind how they, they, they conflicted with censorship and society and, and extremism and, and everything. So uh, they are a big influence on us. And I remember when I was a like was starting, I was so influenced by the American uh, cinema uh, back then. Uh, and the more I grew, the more I got influenced by more other things like yeah. uh, European cinema. And after that, the Korean cinema, I'm a big lover of Korean cinema. And then I, after I discovered uh, uh, our heritage more in depth, I, I started like being more influenced by what the, these directors did uh, uh, in their times because uh, when I watch, when I read all the interviews of Egyptian directors in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they almost had exactly our same issue we live with, with today. Literally, like the star system, the censorship, the politics, the yeah, the the right wing <laughs> in society, like the the conservatism, the the extremism. Uh, so uh, that's why I think now they influence me more uh, because. Uh, we share the same issues, and it's very uh, ironic and a bit frustrating that you discover that after like at least 60, 70 years, the same exact problems are still there with, yeah. with doing a film in Egypt. I want to ask you one more question before we get to paranormal, actually. Um, and it's a, it's a question getting into that. So I have on the screen some of the stuff that you've written over the course of your career and paranormal sits as the only series, um, yeah. in the U S uh, driven largely by streaming. Um, we see this trend that most of the most interesting storytelling is happening in, in TV. Uh, I think, I think I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think these are the projects that I wrote. You, these are the projects that you've written. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Not the ones that you've directed. Yeah. The ones that you've written. So I'm, I'm curious about, do you feel like that trend is also happening in the Arab world where there is more funding going for towards series than towards uh, movies and that there is this sort of migration into serial storytelling versus uh, traditional movies? Uh, yeah, of course, with 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 the TV channels putting more money in TV series with with the platforms. Um, uh, there are stories now that you really like is, are, are more suitable to say the least to 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 become a serious uh, uh, and sometimes there are like if you don't like uh, uh, yeah like to, to answer this in, in, in the shortest ways is that yes there are a lot of uh, projects that will have a hard time uh, if, if, if you want to turn them into a film and you will have a better chance if you if you pitch them as a TV show you will have a better chance to make them depending on the idea, how, how much it costs and, and what is the financial return. A lot of factors, uh, the, the actors, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, TV became uh, a place where uh, a lot of projects that you thought like would have never made it would turn into screen if you turn them into a series or, or a platform t or a flat platform film. Yeah. Amazing. Um, were you surprised, um, or like, I mean, pleasantly surprised by the the excitement about paranormal? Uh, I was not surprised. I was more uh, terrified, if I may say. Why? <laughs> because uh, uh, you know, like paranormal had hardcore fans. I was one of them. I, I I'm still one of them. I I, I was a hard core fan of Ahmed Khayt Tawfiq, the writer. I was a hardcore fan of Paranormal, even the other book series he wrote or, or the novels he wrote. Uh, he was like a father figure to me. And once we announced that we're going to do Paranormal, I remember like the expectations and, and, and the pressure the fans put on you is, is, is unbearable, man. Like it was, it was really, uh, uh, I was like 
I felt like I was kidnapping uh, the the babies. Uh, uh, it was it was really hard, and they were like really aggressive about like how are we gonna make, whose act is you know she was who's like uh, what which books you gonna like uh, use in the, in the first season and and people in the street would like uh, ask me all the time about it. And I remember when it came out, like uh, the hardcore fans were like. They, they they were not kidding them. Like they were really hard. Of, like if they didn't like something in the show, they would slaughter you. Even in the streets, I used to meet people in the streets who were angry about this scene or this character or this action sequence or, or, or this visual effects, and 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 they would slaughter you in the street. You know, it was like it, it was serious. Uh, I, as if as if it's a cult. You know, uh, and uh, what what was ironic about the show that it actually made better like like it 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 the the reactions on the show internationally were way better than the internet the reactions internally in, in locally in Egypt because yeah. Egyptian people were like so hyped about the books so hyped about the first uh production Egypt, Netflix production in Egypt so the expectations were like that high you can you, like everyone was uh was being a critic I remember like I used to like people who used to send me at least like uh, every day at least ten or fifteen like professional critique from normal people <laughs> about the show, like a very long uh, critique about the show. Uh, and uh, I think until now, it's the most impactful project I made. Like it made an impact that was beyond imagination. Uh, I, I guess if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm measuring this uh, by IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes or Cinema.com or, or the people meeting me in the street, the vast majority uh, love the show. Uh, but those who were really angry at the show, like they were very loud. So yeah. because They're always it, the loudest. Yeah, they always the loudest, and, and and I understand that it happens with all the big adaptations. You know, like Harry Potter is the same. Like all all the films that are Lord of Rings is the same. Like. When you when you when you go like to adapt a book that has this big fan base, that what happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Okay, we're going to end with our uh, films of note. Um, we like to ask you to send over some films that are based off a couple of different questions. So these are somewhat rapid fire. So the first one is film that influenced your most influenced Esma. Yeah, it was definitely modern than through the scene side uh, because uh, I was fond of that director when I was young, Alejandro Amanabar. And uh, Alejandro, or Alejandro uh, had an interesting story. He made this small film in Spain. It got a lot of attention internationally. Uh, then uh, he was offered to do a film in the US and he went to do this film uh, the Others with Nicole Kidman. And he made The Others and it was one of the highest grossing film ever. Although it was a very low budget film. So it was a huge success in the States. Yeah. So I thought after that he's going to like direct, of course, like maybe like a Superman or like a uh, Star Wars kind of film. Of course he can do whatever he wants now. He made this amazing success, but I, but he actually decided that he would go back to his country again, Spain, and find a true story from his country to tell to the world. And that was very inspiring. So, so I decided I want to do the same back then. Like it's, it, it, it's, I, I kind of like uh, connected with that story and I decided like, yeah, I want to do something from within. I want to do dig deep in my culture and, and tell a story to the world. And that's how I made Asma. And the same thing, uh, there was something uh, similar about the films because both have the theme of man against the system or man uh, against the world. So uh, uh, my identity was about a man who was trying to, uh, a poet, wanted to kill himself and he was actually filing a lawsuit against the system that he would not allow him to kill himself because he can't kill himself because he's totally paralyzed. So uh, it was uh, an emotional film. I watched it more than 300 times when I was writing Asma. It was like a screensaver on my screen 
while I was writing because it was so emotional and uh, it, it's definitely one of my favorite films. Wow. Um, amazing. The film that you really loved as a kid. Of course, Edie. Uh, <laughs> like I think if you ask my generation, half of them at least would say E.T. E.T. Yeah. is about uh, uh, friendship. It's about home. And I remember when I watched it as a kid, because back then you would not, you were not that able to pick a film you watch. You watch something on TV and it doesn't come back again. So for, for at least seven or eight years, I thought that was a dream that I had. E.T. was a dream I had. Like I loved it that much. I kept obsessing about it in my head. I didn't watch it again. Nobody watched it with me. I couldn't even uh, verify with anyone that, did you see that with me? A kid with like an alien creature, like being friends. And This is also a, an experience that uh, people, young, younger people don't know because if yeah. you didn't catch the opening title, you didn't want, you didn't know what the film yeah, was called exactly. and you exactly. describe it to friends, but like there yes. was this thing and they touched and I don't know. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I didn't know the name of the film. I, yeah. I literally thought it was a dream until like, maybe I was, like, I don't the know. Bicy- like, the bicycle and the moon. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it sounds ridiculous, right? When you, when you tell it to someone who didn't watch the film, it's like, what are you talking about? What bicycle yeah. flying? And I remember like, until I was like 14, 15, 16, I watched it. I found it. Like I watched it and I was like, that was real. That was not a dream that I had when I was a kid. Like <laughs> I, like I spent years thinking that was, that was a dream. Uh, uh, I had, I had the I, exact same thing with the gremlins. With what? The gremlins. Do you remember? The gremlins. That film? Yeah. yeah, sure. It, many years later, I was like, Oh wow. That was a real movie. I thought I dreamt that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that how, that's how valuable uh, films were when we were kids. It's like, yeah. if you want to find a film and watch it, that was a journey. That was an adventure. Exactly. Like, yeah, and, and sometimes you have to wait for two months in the video store to, to, to find the tape yeah. like, when someone returns it back. A film that is so underrated. Yeah, Zodiac. Uh, uh, Zodiac is... is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of David Fincher. Like, he's one of my favorite directors of all time. And uh, he's, a, he's a true mastermind. And uh, Zodiac was the least uh, <laughs> successful film for him. Uh, it's the only film that he made that he didn't make money and uh, uh, I remember watching it in the theater the first time it was super long although I I I really really enjoyed it and I watched it I think three three times in the theater Uh, and I loved the authenticity of it and how much he wanted to tell the story as it is uh, and being true to the source material uh, and and to the true story and that's why I love the film and although when People who are not very familiar with David Fincher, if you tell them like Fight Club, they would know it. Seven, they would know it. Case, case of Benjamin Watson, Girl, Dragon, that too. Any of his films, they would be uh, very familiar with them, except yeah. uh, maybe Zodiac and his last film, Monk. But uh, uh, Zodiac, I, I really think, is, is, is a masterpiece that was not, uh, 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 like, uh, didn't have the, 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 the reaction uh, that, of course, they wished for. Yeah, you know, it's funny. As I was watching Asma, I feel like you use color very effectively yeah. um, in kind of a finchery way where it's sort of there's the like the greenish blue of the television world and there's the very vibrant radiant uh, yes. uh, of the rural world. And then there's the muted tones of her life. Yeah. I think you did that really, really effectively. Um, yeah, that's also influenced, I guess, by 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 the films I watched in in the nineties and the early two thousands, yeah. I was studying cinema, like Fincher films, and and actually the the Matrix did that brilliantly back then. Yeah, the Matrix for sure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, okay, so we have a few more. Uh, the film that uh, that film students must watch. Yeah, uh, Separation is is another masterpiece, and. I would recommend it to film students for one thing. It's all about the story. Story is king. So it's not about how you shoot it. It's not about how famous the actors are. It's not about how big the film is. You can tell a story uh, that is so simple and still make an award-winning film, film, a film that wins an Oscar, uh, uh, wins at Cannes, 
I always say about Asghar Farhadi that the director. This is a Persian. This is a Persian film, right? Yes, and the director Asghar Farhadi. The interesting thing about his films is that if it sounds, I always say that it sounds like the stories my mom told me when I want to hang up, like about the neighbor who like did this with his <laughs> wife, or and those boring stories that like like I I would never make a film about that, you know. And he he managed to make films about what I call the stories of my mother. Uh, and he does them brilliantly uh, as, as, and, and, and he makes them with, 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 with genre. Uh, it's, it's like a mystery film done in a real setting and with the real stories of real people. So uh, I think uh, Azar Fahari is, 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 is the, the director nowadays that you should learn from because it's about how he crafts a story. Uh, real stories that you don't need a lot of money, you don't need the best camera in the world, you don't need this or that, you just need good story, good acting, and you do a, mas- a film that can travel and, and can impress the whole world. Amazing. Um, a film that always makes you laugh. Yeah, Ya Rab Walad, Samir Ghanim. This is like the perks of what we used to call the era of construction films, like uh, construction cinema. We call it like that because back then people used to make films to just put them on VHS and send them to the Gulf countries to sell them. To back then, films were making a lot of money. If you make a cheap film, you're gonna make a lot of money. So a lot of like people working in con- like uh, businessmen working in construction started producing films because it was more uh, profitable than working construction. That was that's why we call it the construction era. So. Nice. So the construction of Cinema Ma'awlet was like the worst films you can ever watch. But the perks of that era is that it had a lot of creative freedom and people would just have fun making a film. So Ya Rabbu Walad is supposedly one of uh, uh, the films in this era, but still it's one of the best films of this era. And Samir Ghanim is my favorite comedian of all time in Egypt. And in this film, uh, uh, like I, 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 I know his lines word by word. I can literally, when the film going, like say it all with him because uh, it was it was so fun. And you don't care about the story, you don't care about anything. You just care about Samir Ghanim being on screen, saying uh, his lines. It's 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 so fun. That's awesome. Um, film that you re- watch all the time. Of course, Fight Club. Fight Club is the film that made me obsessed with cinema. And Fight Club is the film that is, I always say, if I would make a PhD, I would make it about Fight Club. Uh, it's, uh, it was an obsession when I was a kid and it still is an obsession. Every time I watch it, I, I discover new things in the film. Uh, and uh, uh, whenever I feel frustrated or like hating my job, which is I feel like at least every week, uh, I would go watch uh, Fight Club again to remember why I love cinema. Amazing. And the last one I'll make you do is a film that changed m- most changed how you think. Yeah, a Serious Man. A Serious Man is is another underrated film. It's one of uh, the. It's, it's a film by Coen Brothers. Yeah, and it's one of the least films they like. Uh, uh, they got claimed for. Uh, it's uh, it's a film about God, about faith, about life, about the meaning of life, and I love it. I love it so much because it's so deep. It's hilarious. I find it hilarious, and uh, it really asks uh, uh, very interesting questions about life and the meaning of life. That's why I remember when I watched the film the first time, I didn't get it at all. Uh, but I felt that I there's something interesting about that film and then I got the chance to watch it again and when I watched it again uh, I felt like wow uh, it made me think a lot this is the film I watched and made me think a lot yeah no I, I love the I love the serious man um, yeah, cool. Hamid thanks so much for doing this I want to wrap up um, thank you this was a lot of fun um, I highly recommend everyone if you haven't seen Esma it's on Netflix it's a really really interesting a film and it sheds light on a topic I didn't know enough about. Uh, Ahmed, thanks so much for your work and hopefully we'll get to uh, meet each other soon. 
Hopefully, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that. Thank okay, you so everybody. much.